I'd like to uh, introduce our, our guest uh, today. He is uh, a popular performer here at the Magic Castle, and he's also uh, the author of several books about the spirit world. Right. So, Tom Ogden, uh, now you've written, is it two books on the spirit world? Is that correct? It's um, eight. Pardon me. <laughs> eight books? Yes. I'm uh, in your first eight. one, am I not? Yes, the, the, you were on, the, <laughs> no, no, you were in my th third one. Um, I had written, uh, most of the magicians know, uh, I had written the competition book to Magic for Dummies. There's a competing series called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Fill yeah. in the Blank. And I wrote The Complete Idiot's Guide to Magic Tricks. And when that was in proof sheets, my editor said, we now want to do a lifestyle book, not an instruction book, but a lifestyle book on ghosts, on yeah. hauntings. You're a magician, you must know all about ghosts. And yeah. I said... I sure. said, does it pay in advance against royalties? He said, yes, yeah. I know everything there is to know. <laughs> uh, so I started research. And, of course, I knew nothing. I knew about Pepper's Ghost and Spookaroos and, you know, thing, how, to, how to make translucent stuff float in the dark, but nothing about ghost philosophy. And in re researching the book, it, it was just fascinating that there are ghost societies that sit around and posit questions like, if a ghost is the returning soul of a deceased person, why would Washington appear on a horse? Are you saying animals have souls? Why would you see the ghost of Abraham Lincoln's funeral train traveling on the railroad track between D.C. and Springfield? Uh, are inanimate objects, how can they be ghosts? Uh, so they tried to find question, answers to questions like, why do some people see an apparition? But other people will just hear things, mm -hmm. or they'll just have the skin, you know, skin crawl, or the hairs go up on their neck. They just sense something's wrong, and try to come up with some yeah. universal theory. Uh, so it was a fascinating study. And as it turned out, my editor from that book moved over a diff to a different publishing house and said, "We're starting a series of haunted books, and we're." I had done something different than most ghost books out there. Uh, directories usually uh, do it by uh, countries, states, cities. Mm -hmm. But I decided to break it down according to venues because most ghosts do not haunt people. They haunt places. So I did haunted vehicles, haunted houses, haunted schools, haunted mm -hmm. so on. And that's what this new book series wanted. And they came to me, I mean, authors don't want to hear this, but they came to me and said, we, just like the other book, they said, we want you to write a book called Haunted Highways. Will you write it for us? We liked your other book. Mm -hmm. So the Haunted Highways was the first. The book that your story was in was Haunted Hotels. Ah, I get haunted in a hotel once. I've been to the other side, folks. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, I don't want to tell about it. No, right. it's... Well, but, that's the future uh, who's who when you're interviewing. That's right, because I, I want to focus on ghosts here at the yes. Magic Castle who supposedly uh, roam the hallways here. Now, you know something? I, y you're working Which I didn't know, by the way, until, until, you started doing until this. I started writing Haunted so in Hollywood. So all, all the years that you've performed here, you've never had any weird experiences no. then, huh? No. I tell you, I work, uh, you were working the late par or you're working early parlor this week, but working that late parlor sometimes, when you're doing that last show and you're done around 1 o'clock and you're cleaning up, and they shut the doors over here and down here. I tell you, it's, it's a little creepy. I mean, I get a little creeped out, you know. And that's when, of then course. Then again, I've been to the other side. Ah, yes. But, um, yeah, don't you? Well, you were visited from the other side. Yeah. You were visited by one of those. So you never had that feeling? You mean just walking late night through the cleaning up in the, after your show in the parlor? Or you... I think because I've been studying the parent, I am not a medium. And I'm not what they would call a, a sensitive, someone who is sensitive to spirits around. And because of the magic background, while I'm also not a debunker, I also think I want to see something too much. Yeah. And I think that's why, if there is something, yeah. it doesn't reveal itself. Got it. Now, in my, I was talking to George Siegel, who is the castle historian. He knows everything about the magic castle. Um... And there's five 
people who have died in the physical structure of the building. Did you know this? I've only known of two. Who are the other? All right, we have, oh, these are Danny Cole's cards, pardon me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have, in 1912, Catherine Lane's mother died. And that would be, I believe, oh. the wife, the mother of Rollin Lane. The, Rollin's mother-in-law. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, Rowland Lane uh, was the builder of the of the uh, the building of structure here. Uh, Rowland Lane's mother died in 1922 in the structure here. Rowland Lane himself died in 1940 in what is now the séance room. In the séance room, that was his bedroom. That was his bedroom. Hmm, interesting. And there was an actor by the name of Harry Stafford, who had done uh, if you IMBD him, he did probably about 20 to 30 movies in the 20s and 30s. Short little. He died in 1950 when this was an old people's home. Oh, during that boarding house yeah, period. Yeah. Harry Stafford was his name. And the fifth guy was the gentleman who died in the parlor, right? Chris Michaels. Tell me that story. I, he, was between, he was working the parlor that week uh -huh. in between shows. Uh, he wasn't ill, but he, and he wasn't particularly elderly, but he was at that age, you know. And in between shows, he sat down to rest in the front row in the parlor. And the host came in to rouse him to, to wake up for his next parlor show, and he was gone. <laughs> he had left the building. Yeah. Um, but as far as I know, none of these, none of those, these people I mentioned uh, actually... Has never been seen never been recognizably seen. as an apparition. Exactly, exactly. Now, another interesting fact I heard, and you may not be aware of this, but uh, editor extraordinaire uh, Steve Kiesel... Uh, was telling me in his research of, the Holly, of this area is that um, at one time the, uh, uh, where the Yamashiro is, it used to be called the what? The Burke, the Bernheimer House and Gardens. Um, yes, it was a private residence too yeah, yeah. before it became Yamashiro. Uh, but prior to that, it was a sycamore grove and Sycamore uh, Avenue was named after it. And they used to do all the, the, all the early hangings in Los Angeles in the late 1800s were done in this area where the Yamashiro is above, you know, around yeah. here too. So that's just an interesting tidbit you might want to use in yes. your book sometime. Uh, the cr criminals would, would be hung mm. in this area. Um, cheerful little show, isn't it? The, Holly, the, ho <laughs> the Hollywood criminals, the downtown LA criminals, <laughs> exactly. had all their own around uh, where Union Station is now. The, the trees along there, every other tree was a hanging tree. So perhaps, all, perhaps that influence is, uh, you know, part of this, this building and It's possible knows? because one of the questions is, if any building is old enough, it's had a history of many people that have gone through it, mm -hmm. because it's not necessary that a person has died in a place that they've returned there. It's they've had some emotional connection to it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the theories of what ghosts actually are uh, is they're not necessarily soul spirits of a person uh, after death, but during life that their, for lack of a better word, aura, has impressed itself on the place while they were still alive. Mm -hmm. And what we're actually seeing is not a returning spirit from beyond, but the same as if it were a movie on, a film clip on a loop that's just replaying its over and over, yeah. and that's why it's always in that area uh -huh. instead of someplace else. Yeah. That's another theory of what we're actually seeing. Uh -huh. So here at the Magic Castle, and chronologically then, uh, the castle was opened in, what, 1963, I believe? Was right. That uh, in the 60s, were there any ghost uh, sightings? Well, of course, the, this whole area, this where we're taping now, the inner circle, was the underground garage behind the building. Uh, and the annex above us uh, wasn't built until the 70s. Mm -hmm. It was built on top of the top of the parking structure. So everything from the dining room in this direction only dates to the 70s. So there's not a very long history for there right. have been an accumulation of spirits. So that's one of the big questions of why yeah. this area is as haunted as the mansion period. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is a big question. Uh, so, but, in, but in that period of the 60s, 63 to was, did any were, were there any stories about anything happening in the, in the regular building that you're aware of? Um, well, no, but no, because the stories that I've heard have been people from the last couple of decades. Okay. And I don't know how far back 
the, whether it goes back to the 60s of when they first had the encounters. Uh, because there's a whole generation who came, and I didn't move to Los Angeles till 83. So while there may have been, they weren't here anymore for me to ask. Okay. Uh, and when, do, when did it happen? Uh, there's, there's two stories that are really good. The one is about uh, is it Ed Fowler in the seance room. Mm -hmm. what, what was that in the early 70s? Yes. Ed, Ed Fowler, uh, E. Raymond Carlyle, he worked as, was the first medium in the seance room. And as you know, the, se the seance is not a seance seance, but a recreation, entertainment recreation of what might have happened gone in a seance. And even then, he was doing the two-part seance, that the first half was a combination of bizarre magic or spirit-themed magic, followed by Disneyland, the lights go out and the things move in the dark. Uh, but he had finished his seance, and two women who had been there came up to him and said, we, we really love the show, but the part we liked best was when the little girl appeared over your shoulder and kept calling your name. <laughs> now, what they didn't realize, that he had had a young daughter who had been killed in a traffic accident in the street the week before. And when they described what this little girl looked like, he, it was his daughter to a T. And so he took a period off while he wasn't doing the seances till he was finally able to come back into the room. Um, uh, Leo Costa, who is our now uh, seance, has told me that he's experienced, uh, even during the day, that he'd come in and he'd see a, a light orb. He's come in, Tom, our sound of light man, <laughs> uh, who is responsible for many of the effects there, uh -huh. uh, told me previously that he has, he's been in times that he knew that they weren't turned on, that the chandelier had been moving and there was no breeze in the room. Alma Carey, who is one of our magician members and is a medium, uh, was trained by Leo, this would have been, I guess, in the early part of 2000, or around that area, to substitute on nights when he, he wasn't available. And one of the times she wasn't there, he wasn't with her during the day, she was back checking the controls the, the secret something uh, in the room, back while the, where the bun machine is, where the cinnamon buns are. And, um, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw in the seance room uh, an elderly man dressed in white, no jacket but white pants and slacks, and a little girl. Hmm. And when she looked back, they were by then in the cherub room. Now, she hadn't seen them leave the room, but she could see they were over there. And when she went out, then she finished what she was doing with the electronics. And when she went out, she could not find them anywhere. <laughs> now, it's not the only place that little girl has been seen. Uh, she's also been seen over in the other part of the building by the hat and hair running up and down the hallway between the museum area and the hat and hair area. A lot of these sightings are done by staff, even in the daylight area, era times, while they're here cleaning up after us. <laughs> yeah, it was a great, uh, the, uh, I saw the woman this morning, uh, 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 part of the cleaning crew. She was here around uh, 5 a.m. And this happened about, uh, when did Di Vernon die? In the 1992, oh, I think. Years there ago, about something like that? Uh, anyway, she was working in the parlor, right? Have you heard, you've heard this story, right? She was working in the, she was, she was cleaning up in the parlor at 5 a.m. And she, she walked in there, and there was Di Vernon sitting in the front row. She, had, she didn't know that he had died. Oh. And she knew him in, in, in life. And he was sitting there, and she, wa she sort of went up to him and was going to ask if he needed anything, you know. And he just, he acknowledged her, and then he got up, walked up the stairs, and went through the wall in the back. I guess it used to be an exit, actually, at one time. And he just sort mm. of, I guess, either melted into the wall or what happened. But uh, she was pretty credible, uh, a pretty credible, um, you know, She's, you know, pr she was actually saying this in Spanish as Jesse, the maintenance guy, was translating for her. It was a great story. Though. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Katrina, one of our current cocktail servers, uh, she can't say that it was Vernon because she didn't know Vernon, but coming down by the outside of the parlor, she saw a man walking 
stooped over in Vernon's, you know, typical, because Vernon had broken his arms when he was young, so mm -hmm. he, they never quite le completely straightened out, walking toward the Vernon corner there and vanish in that area that she saw whatever the gentleman was vanish. And, of course, as we know, there's a remnant of uh, Vernon in that area. Yeah. But she doesn't know, didn't know him to look, to remember at the time, oh, that's Vernon. But it's um, possibly not the only time that he's been there. And now, Marty, while we're on the subject of the parlor, Marty Rosenstock, one of our, our house managers, uh, told me of a an amazing story that he had up at the parlor. As anyone, as all businesses do, if you're closing up for the night, you start at the far end of the building and you work toward the front entrance, closing everything along the way, making sure everybody's out of the building and everything's shut down. And he had started one night up here at the top of the stairs, closing the locked door at the top of the staircase, going up to the from the inner circle, uh, by the parlor, and turned off all the lights in the parlor, he then worked over to the palace, made sure all the lights were out there, cut the electrical circuits so there was nothing back into this area, and was setting the alarm by the green room area. And when he came back out, he noticed that the stained glass, the lights behind the stained glass that are in front of the parlor were on, that the lights had somehow come back on. But of course, you know, you know this building, who knows where the wiring goes <laughs> that they're going to be. Yeah. It's an old building. So he walks back and he also notices that he sees light coming under the door from the parlor that he had locked, that the lights are back on. And when he opened the door, not only was a light on, but all of the lights were on and all of the spotlights were back on. All the spotlights were well, on? Everything was on. So oh, he turns wow. them down again, turns them off. He had no sooner shut the door and had not even gotten back to the palace bar when he saw the lights back on again. And he went back. Now, remember, supposedly the circuits weren't even right. working anymore for that part of the building. And he went back on and he said out loud, okay, who's ever do I got to get out of here, <laughs> cut it out. And the lights went out. Wow. And he just left. And he'll tell you that story himself. Wow. And they went out in the parlor. In, this was in the parlor. In the parlor. Every, almost every square inch of this building is, uh, is haunted in somewhat. Uh, right outside of the, we're in the inner circle now, Alma, again, Carrie, I was working a buyout uh, because she also works as a fortune teller. And she was, had her table set up right in this area over here in front of the pillar. And while she was setting up, she saw a gentleman, a tall, not old, but 50-ish gentlemen uh, come through the door that's from the valet stand coming in this area uh, tan greenish tan, brown jacket walking he could not have not seen her sitting right here <laughs> came straight toward her ignored her completely walked over paused slightly by the puppet display and then continue up the stairs and she was just curious that he didn't even acknowledge her and so she gets up and follows him and he was no longer on the stairs by that time. So she goes up the stairs, up to the palace bar, and some of the cleaning staff was there. And they were able, in broken English, to explain, oh, yes, we saw them, have seen him, but talked to him. And one of the male staffs, and I haven't been able to find out from her yet. She may not have known their names. Uh, but the gentleman said, Oh, yes, we see him quite frequently. He's always wearing the tan jack, that, that clothing. We don't know who he is, but if you approach him, he just disappears. I don't know why anyone works here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if these, these things actually happen. Uh, right outside between the bar here and the W.C. Fields table, uh, we're not supposed to talk about it, but there used to be a smoking area right outside that door that a lot of the staff would use, and Jules Lanier used to <laughs> frequent out there. And the week after his death, one of his brand New York cigarettes, which was a very unusual brand to, to find in Los Angeles, they found a brand new unwrapped pack of cigarettes right outside where he used to stand that they hadn't seen before. Uh, of course, that wouldn't be the only 
comeback that Jules apparently made. Uh, the night that he died, the, um, what was his name? Emilio? Who was, who? Miliano was Emiliano. working the, the downstairs bar, was working that night. Uh, he, Jules, you remember, always used to, his bar stool was in Irma's room on the other side, sat right there, where it, which is now blocked by the beer dispensers. Uh, okay. But the uh, wiring, the colored tube wiring, decorative lighting, started blinking on and off and went out. And when they tried to fix it, it was, it was fused. They couldn't even get the light bulbs out to, to fix the thing. They finally had to take the whole thing down. Even a few of our regulars appear over time. Uh, Joan Lawton has seen, recognizably, seen the ghost of Johnny Platt here, huh. uh, who appeared up near the ladies' restroom, right at the end of the landing coming from the, I guess it's this way, from the dining room. Uh, he didn't, she, he didn't see, she didn't see him approaching. He was just at the foot of the stairs by the, by the ladies' room near the haunted phone booth. Was he wearing the fez? Uh, wearing the fez. Wearing the fez. <laughs> and she says that she will frequently, while she's standing by the fireplace, by the front doors, I, I mean by the, by the main bar, will sense J.O.C. She was very close with Jay because uh -huh. she was here when, at the time in the 60s when Jay was yeah. working here. Uh, the, one of my favorite stories, of course, series of them come from Brian, Brian Lee. Who, all, who is our stage manager at, of the palace and is often here late at night, closing down after the 11.15 show. And he says on frequent occasions, he is, is closing down his, the board for the night and he will hear a man and a woman talking behind the back curtain against the back wall. Now there's a walkway from the uh, entertainer's dressing room from... Uh, stage left to stage right in the back. Uh, and even though he th thought everyone was out of the club, all the performers were gone, he went back to check, and he would pull back the curtain, the sound would stop, and no one's back there. <laughs> and he'll leave, and five minutes later, it'll start again. <laughs> uh, back before the computerized board went in, he used to have to hand set all of the, the stuff on the old board. And for a while, he carried on the... the the old theater tradition of putting out the ghost light. Do you know what a ghost light is? If you don't know them by name, you've seen them in movies. It's that single pole with a bare light bulb sitting on top that they put on an empty stage overnight. And they turn it on, uh, well, so people who are coming in the dark the next morning don't trip and hurt themselves. But there's an old theater tradition that the, the spirits of the actors and others who have inhabited the theater, return to the stage, and it's to keep the ghosts away. And Brian found that he would, we, he would often come in and the controls had all been played around with, mm -hmm. and there was only on nights that he had forgotten to put out the ghost light. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after Bill Larson's death, uh, Peter Pitt was sitting with Brian at the end of the palace bar by the server stand, and uh, by the grandfather's clock. And he said it was shortly after 1 a.m. And Peter was in one of his, uh, Peter, for those of you who don't know him, was the entertainment director at that time of the Magic Castle. And uh, then for a time he was let go and then he came back again. And, uh, uh, but anyway, Peter was part of this institution for a good 20 years. But he could be very cantankerous and he was saying some sort of unkind things about Bill and he had just passed like three four days before and and Brian says on the mention of Bill's name the grandfather clock which as you know never chimes started chiming it wasn't on the hour of 15 or a half hour it was somewhere in the middle chimed exactly 13 times and stopped, and they both stared at it and changed the subject. <laughs> wow. Uh, Tell me about the, uh, the bartender down in the Hat and oh, Pub. Uh, when the castle, I, it wasn't when they opened in the 60s. I guess it would have been in the late 60s, early 70s. We had a resident bartender. 
Um, why am I blocking? I know his name. Who was the who? Who was the magician who worked here just last week? Who used to be the resident bartender? Bob Jardine. Bob Jardine. Thank you. I'm brain freeze. Bad. Bad. It's the Grey Goose. It's uh, Bob Jardine. <laughs> Before Bob Jardine, there was another resident bartender down in the Hat Hair pub, and his name was Lauren Tate. He was a burly Irishman, um, and Milt has told me that on several occasions, people have come up to him at the downstairs bar and said, we love that bartender downstairs. He is, we love his magic, and he's <laughs> lots of fun in bills. And, and Milt would say, we don't have a resident bartender on 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 duty and they would describe him and it was Lauren who had long gone from the castle and by that time was deceased. Uh, he's not the only one there and they're not the only ones who have experienced him. Other staff has have, as well. Many have gone down clearing up glasses at night and have just felt uneasy in that area. They may not have seen him. Uh, Mark Nelson, who himself is now on the other side, uh, uh, was back during his hosting time, uh, was closing up one night, and was heading downstairs, and the cocktail server, Judy, do you remember Judy's last name? Judy. Um, on an off, off, for no reason at all, said, said to him as he was walking down the stairs, oh, say hi to Lauren for me. <laughs> and he gets down there, and he just knows something is wrong in the room. It just feels creepy, and he comes Jeez. back up quickly and says, why did you mention Lauren? And Judy said, I don't, I don't know. I haven't thought about him in years. Huh. Uh, so that area is also uh, very hot. That side. I haven't heard any stories about the museum side. But I've heard them, and of course, all of the hosts here have experienced, um, when, after closing up at night, the sounds upstairs on the second floor. They'll be down in the downstairs bar area, and in the dining room areas, they will hear footsteps, and some have heard party noises, because remember, that was their bedroom, bedroom area, but they also had an upstairs parlor. The visitor's parlor was downstairs, but then they had the, a family room upstairs where they would also uh, be. So uh, there have been sounds up in that area as well. Wow. Wow. And Tom Ruff was telling me there was a young man who used to work here, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan used to work at night, and, and he, uh, he saw Die Vernon's uh, in the parlor. This is only about six months ago? Yeah. Oh. And Vernon got up and went into the walls, and <laughs> that was that. Uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah, okay, I think we, we hit the, the good ones. Yeah, they're the, uh, but I've, I've, I've had at least a dozen other stories. The all, I won't go into them all. The, Terry Eddings has told me about things that uh, she used to be the gift shop manager here, about, uh, and she used to be here often late working on inventory of things that have happened up in the offices on the third floor. Shredders working on turning on their own behind locked doors. Uh, that she and the staff were in the dining room. Uh, in the they were out on the the terrace, but could see through the crystal room. Uh, what was his name? The general manager at that time it was before Michael Gingras. Um, I'm blocking on his Jim, name. Jim Williams. He was. No. But anyway, as he was coming down, they... Al Davis. They saw, she saw, a large black dog following him down the stairs. Because he went down to the bar, he came back up, no dogs following him. And two of the Filipina staff... Uh, no, no, he wasn't a general manager, he was in, count, in accounting. And they freaked out. Because in their culture, a black... Uh, dog is a death omen <laughs> that if that someone is going to die within a year or terrible misfortune and it was he was the head of accounting uh, he was assaulted in Florida and fell into a coma 
He recovered later, but that happened within a six-month uh-huh. period. So there have been spooky other things here as well. Yeah, and Milt tells a story about Irma playing. Uh, the- oh, yes. Right? Oh, that's great. Yes, Milt one night was working late, and he was, uh, instead of going over to his apartment, he decided just to sleep up in his office that he had upstairs at the time. And during the night, uh, the power went out in the Hollywood area, so all of the electricity in this area of Hollywood was out, and he heard Irma's piano start to play. (laughs) Now, Vernon was still alive at that period, and he liked to tickle the ivories from time to time, and he thought, well, maybe Di's still here. So he goes down, takes a flashlight, and he goes down, and of course, not only was Di not there, but no one was in there, and of course, not only there was no way that the that Irma should have been playing in a in a blackout. All right, enough <laughs> yeah. said. Yeah. Enough yeah. said. Yeah. Wow, terrific, Tom. Thank you very much, Thank you. ladies and gentlemen. Tom Ogden, right here. Thank you. Really well done, well told. Can Cheers. I help? I am. stay. Can I stay yeah. now. Just, just yeah, hang stay. Out. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I just heard. Yeah, he was just telling me about that a young man, Ryan. Who's a big I don't know heavy him. set kid. He oh, to, him. Yeah, he no longer works here. Oh, he's not. Oh, no, he's not the one who's working now. No, no, but uh, yeah, he he plays uh, one night to cleaning up in there. He's burning. I gotta find him. I gotta find oh, him. That, that one thing is on YouTube. That clip of the Spanish woman. Being interviewed by Jesse, telling about her experience seeing Vernon in the morning. It's a yeah. it's a YouTube clip. Oh. Yeah. It actually. If you find out what it is, let me know. So I yeah. Can it's a. Find it. There's a is a group called Ghost Hunters that did some think something here where they actually tried to. Did they really? They tried to go and find that. They did a whole audio thing in the parlor. Oh. It's pretty <coughs> a little ridiculous, but but the inter- her interview with them with Jesse translating is, is there and it's, it's quite good. So.